to the Jews, all right? Understand that the book of Romans was not written to the Jews. The book of Romans was written to who? Romans. The Romans. It's not so hard to figure out, right? The book of Romans. So it's written to the Romans who are where? Where do they live? Rome. Rome. Yeah, see how easy this is? Very easy. We're doing good. Meaning, more than likely, they are what? Romans. Romans. Yeah, they are Gentiles, but no, they're not. Well, they are, but they aren't. They're Christians, right? So, in discussing God's plan of salvation, Paul goes all the way down to what I like to call sandbox level. And that's where you explain every bit as easily as possible because otherwise people don't get it. In doing so, he mentions that the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through the Jews, and then he says, as it is written. Blasphemy. That's a strong word, right? What does it mean? Open Bible study. What is blasphemy? To a, I'm sorry? Okay, to profane, defame, to rail on, to revile someone. Um, the, the Greek word is blasphemeo. Does that sound familiar? We just transliterated that into English and said blasphemy. And it can be used in the sense of speaking evil of a person. And uh, 1 Corinthians 10.30. Will, can you read that for us? You see the example there. 10.30? Mm -hmm. For if I by grace be a partaker, why am I evil spoken of for that which I give thanks? All right, so you can actually blaspheme a person according to the use of the Greek word to evil speak of a person. But often, most often, it is used to describe something worse, something spiritual. It's the attitude and language of those who are wicked or rebellious toward God. And in this case, we need to know that the, the hypocrite is not the one doing the blaspheming here. Remember what he's talking about is the religious hypocrite and he says the religious hypocrite because of in verses 20 and 21 and 22 and 23 because of the way that the religious hypocrites were living the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you so it's not the Jewish religious hypocrite that is blaspheming here in this case it is the Gentiles who are blaspheming and why is that the case Anybody want to take a stab at that? Why is that? And does that still happen? Yes. Yes, okay. All right, why? Uh, seeing the way uh, some people who profess to say they believe in Jesus and then uh, they live a different way. And, uh, they, other people see it and they're like, you're a Christian, you're living this way. Exactly. Must, must not be real. Exactly. So they, they come away going, God is not real. You know, Jesus really doesn't have the power to save. Uh, there is no changed life in Christianity, obviously, from the way you live, right? And which is uh, a shame that that's the case. How many times have you heard of someone proclaiming that they're just as good as the churchgoer down the street? I used to go, especially in our church in the States, uh, when they were having a revival, uh, and even sometimes just, just because. My wife and I would go out, and we'd go door to door, I got some stories I could tell you from that. But, you know, you could go to knock on somebody's door and they would tell you, yeah, I'm a Christian. Well, okay, yeah, I've been to church in 35 years, but I'm a Christian. And you're like, how does that work, you know? Or you meet somebody else and they'll say, I'm never going down to that church. I can't stand that preacher. Well, why? No kidding. He won't let me date, my, he won't let me date his daughter. And I'm looking at this guy thinking to myself, yeah. I, I can see why, you know. And so one of the other excuses that I heard was, I am better than the people in your church. And he may very well have been better than, you know, some of the people in our church. But we're not talking about morality here. What we're talking about is salvation. So that's an excuse. And they begin to actually, sometimes even directly, but most often indirectly, blaspheming God and you know how many times have you heard somebody say that God was a myth God is a myth because believers are the most hypocritical people in the world if they truly had the power that they say they have then why are they living the way they live these are things that people say now I'm going to read you some quotes that I read 
Um, this was a uh, on a popular social media forum, better known as. There we go. Here is the question: Do you think religious hypocrisy in Christianity is the cause of so much atheism? There was the question. Here was some of the responses. Many people, especially the young, view organized religion as irrelevant and out of touch. Others have lost confidence in religion. If you look at the way the churches have behaved over the centuries, people have turned away from them because they no longer believe in them as a moral arbiter. This was what somebody said. This was their opinion. Someone else wrote this. Atheism is not rising. And it's really not. I mean, I've been saved for 37 years, 37 years ago as compared to, to, to today. The, uh, the statistics for how many people in America are atheists has not varied a whole lot. Atheism is not on the rise. However, theism is declining. This is what he wrote. Atheism is, atheism is not rising. Theism is declining. And yes, a lot of it has to do with the weird behavior and hypocrisy many believers bring out into the world. Now, these were comments that people gave in answer to the question. These are their opinions. They're not bona fide fact, they're opinion. They're not verified by, you know, uh, Pew Research Society or anything like that. But this is what some people out there think. And here's another response, and I thought this one was pretty telling. Hypocrisy doesn't make a person into an atheist. In other words, if I'm a hypocrite, that's not going to make you an atheist. But it does make an atheist avoid going to church or allying with any organization that breeds such hypocrisy. In other words, if you're a hypocrite, another person may not become an atheist because you're a hypocrite, but an atheist is certainly not going to want to come to church when he sees how you live. That was his point. That's serious stuff. That is bad. And who's responsible? The religious people are the ones responsible, right? Um, and it's not new. It's no new revelation. The Bible declares that, the, you know, disobedience bleeds, uh, bleeds. Disobedience breeds blasphemy. Okay? Uh, three, three more verses to look at. First, Tim, let me pass these out. Uh, you take First Timothy chapter 6, verse 1. Uh, you take Titus 2, 5. And Kenny, you take uh, 2 Samuel 12, 14. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 1. All right, so we've got a servant. That servant in the New Testament in the first century understands servant to mean not the maid that comes to your house and cleans up from 9 in the morning till 3 o'clock at night and goes home, but a no-kidding servant. You wake up in the middle of the night, want a glass of water, you call him, and he comes with the glass of water, servant, servant. Does everybody follow me? In many cases, pretty much a slave. In some cases, definitely a slave. That's what we're talking about. Notice what it says here. This servant is supposed to honor his master in the name of God and his doctrine so that God would not be blasphemed. Did you notice that? So disobedience to your authority as a servant can cause God to be blasphemed. Let's put that right down to where we work, where we live. If you have a boss over you, and all, all of us do at some level, some way, if you're not, if you're not uh, doing what that boss tells you to do, he's going to know, your work's going to suffer, he's going to see it. And what's he going to say? Here's a guy who is not saved, and you have been shooting your mouth off about being Mr. Christian, and you're not doing your job. What's he going to say? Well, yeah, he could say that. But he's not going to say anything good about God. Guaranteed. You have caused him, given him room to blaspheme. Titus 2.5. All right, so here we have the, the wife in this particular se section is speaking about the responsibilities of the godly wife. And uh, there's a list of things here that she is supposed to do 
And the last one says, obedient to their husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Because if she is not the Christian wife that she needs to be, and especially if her husband is unsaved, he is not going to say kind things about God. Disobedience breeds blasphemy. Let's take a look at one more. 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 14. All right, so who was this about? David. David. What did he do? Uh, okay, got Bathsheba pregnant, went a whole year, lied about it the whole time, or hid it, better, better say, hid it the whole time, and got called out by Nathan the prophet. And Nathan the prophet said this, when you disobeyed God, David, this is what you did. By this deed, you gave great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. Disobedience to God, in this case, breeds blasphemy. Disobedience breeds blasphemy. All right? So we've got four good reference on that. If you include the one from Romans, it's a very serious charge. Um, it's no secret. A lot of people in the world... Um, can't stand Israel. I have never in my life seen so seen so much anti-Semitism than I have seen in the last two to three years. Um, President Trump moved the uh, embassy to Jerusalem. Does everybody remember that? Boy, that just really kind of kicked things off. But they couldn't do a whole lot because President Trump was there. And it was like, yeah, you messed up, we'll kill you. But now he's not there, and boy, it's just getting uglier and uglier and uglier. And I, I can't fathom in my mind how someone could actually hate somebody as much as some people hate them. But whose fault is it? I hear crickets chirping in the woods. Whose fault is it? There is a big portion of the blame that falls squarely on their shoulders, but why? And somebody would immediately say, oh, there you go, pastor, you're an anti-Semite. No, what I am is biblical. Had they obeyed God back in the Old Testament, had they continued doing the things that God wanted them to do, God's way, everything would have been fine. God would have protected them from their enemies and you know all of those promises he gave them. He said, if you do this, I will bless you, bless you, bless you. If you don't do this, I'm going to curse you, curse you, curse you, curse you, curse you, curse you. So they've not been doing this and now they're facing this. They gave their enemies cause to blaspheme. It's a reality. Let's move on to verses 25 through 27 and now we're going to see the equality of the Jews. Remember what the mindset was in the first century, especially among the Jews. And even today, there's, there's a lot of this in the mindset of a Jewish person. That somehow they are, they've got a corner on God. God is their God and everybody else, well, we, we just don't know what we're doing when it comes to religion, you know. And, and uh, so they've got God and we don't. And a lot of them think that way. But according to what Paul writes, yeah, the Gentiles are condemned, Romans 1. But Jews are condemned too, Romans 2. And now he's coming to the end of Romans 2 where he goes, so guess what, guys? We're all equal. Notice how this plays out. Romans chapter 2, verses 25 through 27. For circumcision verily profiteth if thou keep the law. But if thou be a breaker of the law, thy circumcision is made uncircumcision. Therefore, if the circumcision keep the righteousness of the law, Shall not his uncircumcision be counted for circumcision? And shall not uncircumcision, which is by nature, if it fulfill the law, judge thee, who by the letter and circumcision doth transgress the law? It's very interesting. Paul, Paul is using logic here, but understand that this is logic that God is directing. This is God's word. And... You know, verse 25 is one of those verses that you could use as a great example of how you could take something out of context, I guess, to say the opposite of what it really means. Because notice what it says. It says circumcision barely profited. So you can grab that and run with it, you know, and say, see, there it is in the Bible. Circumcision barely profited. But 
only, notice what he says next, if thou keep the law. So yeah, okay, there's some profit to that if you can keep the law. Now there's the problem. Because we can't. Nobody can keep the law. Nobody. So therefore, circumcision does not profit because you couldn't keep the law. Um, the Jews felt that they were specially accepted by God because, well, they were Jews. They even had the teaching that, that Abraham stood at the gate. You know, when we tell jokes about religious jokes in our culture, who's always at the gate? Peter. Peter. Peter's always at the gate, right? And I, I honestly, I don't know. I've never looked this up, but I have, I, I have the opinion, I have a theory that the reason why in all of our jokes Peter is at the gate is because the first guy that told the joke about Peter being at the gate was kind of thinking about how Jesus gave Peter the keys to the kingdom. So I kind of think it goes back to there. Now, I don't know that for a fact. You, you could Google it if you want and correct me later if you want. But the reality is the Jews had their things too. With them, they didn't really joke about religion, but they had lots of these little legends and stories that they told. Guess who was at the gate? Abraham. Abraham. That was a deal for them. So Abraham is at the gate in all of their stories. And that's just, you know, why? Why was Abraham at the gate? Well, um, because Abraham would be able to know if you were a Jew or not. And if you were not a Jew, you didn't get in. Literally, that's what they taught. All right? So Paul comes along and he points out in just a few verses that the Jews, along with everyone else in the world, are equally condemned by God. Because nobody can keep the law. If you're a Jew, you couldn't keep the law in your hand. If you're a Gentile, you couldn't keep the law upon your heart. You're still condemned either way. Equally condemned by the law. Condemned by God because you can't do it. And if you cannot keep the law, then circumcision is worthless. That's exactly his point. Now, let me give you a little golden nugget here. There's a large number of so-called believers that have the same attitude today, but it's, with them it's not circumcision. It's usually something else like baptism. You've got to be baptized to be saved. How many of you have ever heard that? Got to be baptized to be saved. You know, you can go into that water a sinner and come up out of that water and you're still going to be a sinner except you'll be wet. And that's the only thing. All right? Water doesn't wash away sin. What does? The blood of Christ. The blood of Christ. Until you accept the application of the blood of Christ on your behalf, you cannot be saved. It's that simple. It's the blood. Or communion. I was telling you guys a story. I think it was Friday night. I was telling you a story about the time I went to Mass. So, you know, and I wasn't allowed to touch the cookie or have any of the, have any of the grape juice because you know, I was just wicked undone, I guess. And wasn't allowed to touch it. And uh, they were, but I wasn't. And then it kind of got me confused. And I found out later that they actually believe that that's one of the things you have to do in order to be saved. And I'm like, what are they doing to me here? They're condemning me to hell here, you know? But the reality is that's a false doctrine. No religious work that you do is ever going to get you into heaven. Nothing. Whether it's coming to church, giving money to, you know, to the offering, um, you know, whatever you could think of as a religious work, it's not going to matter. But there's a lot of people that teach that. It's almost as if we're living in the first century and we're Jews teaching that somehow circumcision is going to make you a Christian. All the while, it's still Jesus. Jesus is the only way to heaven. Look at verse 27, Romans 2, 27. Shall not uncircumcision, which is by nature, if it fulfill the law, judge thee, who by the letter and circumcision doth transgress the law? Now there's a sense in which the, the righteous Gentile, found righteous in Christ, of course, but the righteous uh, Gentile actually stands in judgment of the hypocritical Jew. There's a sense in which that's true. There's a vast difference between a religious person who tries to follow the law in order to please God and the true saint of God who lives a sanctified life because he's saved. We were on our way to Olivetto's and somebody brought up works. So I forget who brought up works, but, but I, said, uh, I said something to the effect of we don't work to get our salvation, but we work after we're saved. Right? You, as a Christian, you'll do good things. It's, you know, kind of like the Holy Spirit kind of brings that out of us, right? 
We're his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. That's Bible, okay? But we don't work to get saved. There's a lot of people that teach that we do. The Jews did. If you want to be God's child, you have to proselyte to Judaism, and you got to, you know, you got to fulfill all these laws, and one of them being circumcision. Um, in, in one case, you know, what you've got is an ever-abiding stress of fearfulness. If I felt like I had to work to get to heaven, man, I'd be a, I'd be a ball of nerves because how do I know I worked hard enough? Right? I've been working and working and working and working. Man, I don't know if I'm going to make it. Hopefully, hopefully I make it. I don't know. You know, i got this good, bad thing going on. Well, there's no good, bad thing in heaven. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. Okay? That's how we're saved. You can't work it off. You can't earn it by works. You can't lose it by works either, by the way. So Paul is bringing this out that there is absolutely, there's a, stress in that there's fear in that there's no peace in that so paul points out that what we have is a condition where the true believer's life becomes a judgment or a witness of judgment i guess i could say it that way against the hypocritical so-called saint all right uh let's do the last couple of verses and then we'll be done the definition of a jew what is a jew without reading the verses everyone look up here it might be too late actually what's a jew Somebody who's Jewish. How do I get to be Jewish? You be from, uh, from Israel. You've got to be from Israel. Okay? I'm hearing mumblings over here. I'm ignoring you on purpose. I don't want that answer just yet. All right? But you're right. Most people, their idea of a Jew is a guy that was, I don't know, was born a Jew. It traced me back to Abraham or whatever, you know. And that's a Jew. But what does Paul say? Notice this. Romans chapter 2, verses 28 and 29. For he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly. That's circumcision, remember? Neither is that circumcision, which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew, which is one inwardly. And circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. In the Jewish mind, there's no separation between physical circumcision and Judaism. They go together. There's one and the same in their minds. In one sense, they're right. Uh, God gave Abraham the sign of circumcision uh, in relation to the Abrahamic covenant. We won't read that, but you could go back and look at Genesis chapter 17, uh, verses 10 through 14, where God does that. And God gives him the covenant, the covenant of Abraham, and the sign of the covenant was circumcision. All right? So, um, Paul says that's not it. See, what was lacking was the spiritual aspect. The spiritual aspect which Paul refers to as circumcision of the heart. True circumcision is not a physical act. It's of the heart, in the spirit, and not of the letter. You remember when Jesus met Nathaniel? Does anybody remember Nathaniel? <laughs> Does anybody remember Jesus? Is anybody awake? When Jesus met Nathaniel, what did he say about Nathaniel? Does anybody uh, he remember? Said, oh, uh, he said, uh, now here's a real... Uh, oh, wait. Go ahead, give it to us in the Manasseh paraphrase version. Just put it in your own words. You're getting there. I'm forgetting what exactly it is, but... All right, anybody else want to take a stab and help him out? No, Jesus, Jesus didn't say that. No. What did Jesus say about Nathaniel? I'm sorry? Right. So, Jesus said, Behold an Israelite whom is no God. That's what he said about Nathaniel. An Israelite indeed, in whom is no, Nathaniel was not only a Jew by birth, but he was also a Jew in heart. Sometimes it seems as if God is completely finished with the Jews. You know, you can read some places in the, in the Bible, it sounds like God is done with them altogether. And then there's other places you can read, and it sounds like, like, the, like the Jews have been, you know, replaced by the church. And then you read other places, uh, and it's clear that there's still yet a very big future ahead for Israel. And sometimes, all, you know, you read all these verses and if you don't know, if you don't have a good outline in your mind of Bible prophecy, sometimes it can get kind of confusing. You wonder what in the world is going on. And if we're not careful, um, then we will start, you know, not rightly dividing the word like, like we should. But, but just know this, all right? 
There is not only a physical aspect to obedience, but there is a spiritual aspect to obedience too. All right? Spiritual aspect. And a true Jew that is circumcised in the heart as well as in the flesh, that's a true Jew. In fact, all believers have been circumcised. Did you know that? Yeah. Um, my, my lovely wife is going to read Colossians chapter 2, verse 11, right? Yes, ma'am? Yeah. Colossians 2, 11. And uh, let's see, Brother, Brother Dew, why don't you read uh, Revelation chapter 2, verse 9? And uh, let's see, Caleb, you read Revelation chapter 3, verse 9, okay? 3, 9, yes. Colossians 2, 11, are you there? Okay, go ahead and read that. So we're all circumcised. If you're if you're a Christian, you're circumcised. But it's not a physical thing. All right. Uh, the same concept is mentioned in the book of Revelation, uh, chapter two, verse nine. Uh, there's a two nine and a three nine. I think you had three nine, and brother Dew has two nine. So these Jews said that they were Jews and Jesus said, no, you're from the synagogue of Satan. You're not Jews. You're from the synagogue of Satan. Revelation 3, 9. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee. So in both of those cases are spoken of as you know, the Jews are spoken of as those that cause suffering to the church. And the point of view taken in the book of Revelation is that a true Jew is not one of blood, but one of faith. That's what we find, you know, throughout the scriptures. John 1.13, let's read that. And then uh, I think we'll, we'll pause here and come back next week. Finish this up. John 1.13, and who can I pick on? Who... Kenny, did you read? Uh, I, I did. Sir. You did? Okay. Chan, did you read? You want to read that? John 1 13? Chapter 1, the whole chapter. Just kidding. <laughs> Just verse 13. All right, so you're not born again based upon your birth or your bloodline. It's the circumcision of the heart that makes you a child of God. And God does that, all right? Not man. So we'll stop here. We'll come back to that and finish up this thought next week and then move on from there. Any questions or comments on this? Nobody? That's good because sometimes you guys ask some pretty hard questions. <laughs> How many angels can you put on the head of a pin? Would that be a ballpoint pin? Or, yeah. Answer a question with a question. It gets you out of trouble. All right. In that case, let's close in prayer. And uh, Manasseh closes in prayer.